There's a big difference between growing up and becoming spiritually mature, isn't there? A huge difference between just growing up and becoming spiritually mature. Now, we've been reading out of 1 Thessalonians as you've been following along in our reading that's on the back of your bulletin. As we've read through 1 Thessalonians, um, there is an amazing thing. The Thessalonian church is mature. Now, here's, here's the thing about that. Paul was in Thessalonica for three Sabbaths, okay? And then he had to leave. And now it's been several months, and he's worried about what's going on in this church that he just barely had time to get started. And so he writes this letter, and he discovers that they are spiritually mature. They are filled with love. They're filled with hope. They're filled with faith. And not only that, we could add a fourth one. They are facing persecution and standing up strongly under it. Now, how did they become so mature in such a short time? Well, that's what we want to take a look at today. So if you'll take your Bibles, I'd like for you to turn to 1 Thessalonians. And I'm going to be using the NIV. And we're going to read the very first chapter. First Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 1 through 10. Paul and Silas and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace to you. Now listen to this part. We always thank God for all of you mentioning you in our prayers. We continually remember before our God the Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers loved of God, that he has chosen you because of our gospel. When it came, it came not with just words, but with power, with the Holy Spirit, with deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us. Wow, that's a pretty bold statement. We're going to come back to that. You were imitators of us and of the Lord. In spite of severe suffering, you welcomed the message with joy given by the Holy Spirit. And so you become a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it, for they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he rescued from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. Now, we find several things here about... Um, about becoming mature, but what I'd like to, to point out at the very beginning is that they had faith. They had the works of faith. And faith is the ability to see the things that our eyes can't see. We see with faith the realities of eternity. With these eyes, we see shadows. All of these things that we see are shadows of what is to come and what truly is. This last week, little Gabe was crawling around on the, on, the, on the porch, and he saw his shadow for the first time. And he's kind of checking out that shadow and moving around a little bit. And everything that we see with our eyes is a shadow. The reality is what we see with the eyes of faith. And then it goes on to say that uh, they labored with love. And make no mistake about it, love requires labor, doesn't it? Amen. Amen. In 1 Corinthians 12, verse 8, in the message, it says that if you have the gift of, of showing mercy, I just love this, do it cheerfully. 
you can help others in need, do it cheerfully. Now, those folks that you help that are manipulative, you know they're just working on your, uh, your last nerve. You, you just, you know that they're going to take whatever you give them and it's not going to work out right. And <sighs> Love them cheerfully. Love them cheerfully. Even if they're manipulating you. Doesn't mean necessarily that you give them what they, they want or ask for but it does mean that you deal with them very gently and that you deal with them cheerfully. Sometimes we don't always do that. You know, God has a purpose for bringing uh, those kind of folks into our lives, and that is to teach us love. Pretty easy to love each other, isn't it? Well, you're just a lovable kind of guy. But sometimes there are people that you help and they never say thank you. They seem entitled. And you know what? Love them anyway. Love them with a smile. The whole purpose of life is to love. In 1 Corinthians 13, 3, in the message, it says, it doesn't matter what I say. It doesn't matter what I believe. It doesn't matter what I do. I am bankrupt without love. And I love that passage. I'm bankrupt if I don't have any love. It doesn't matter what I do. It doesn't matter what I believe or what I say. I'm bankrupt without love. Love is the purpose for our being, to love the Lord our God with all of our heart and soul and strength and mind and to love our neighbor as ourself. Do you remember we had that memory verse? Our role is going to find its meaning as we begin to love. Love isn't just a feeling. Love is a choice. For some of you young guys, you know, we talk about love and we think of the lovey-dovey, mushy-gushy kind of stuff. No, that's not biblical love. <laughs> not at all. Biblical love is a man getting nails slammed in his hands and in his feet and then lifting him up on the cross and he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Now, Jesus is fully God and he's fully man, but I just think of him as being a man's man in that moment. That's the kind of man that I want to follow. Amen. I don't, the lovey-dovey, wishy-washy stuff, it doesn't cut it. That's not the love that changes the world. The love that changes the world is the love of Jesus Christ. Now, the question is, and I'd just like to throw this out, how much teaching and discipling have you had over the years? How much teaching and discipling over the years, and how spiritually mature are you? I looked at this a month then they're kind of on their own, not really the Holy Spirit's there. But they grew to have a tremendous, tremendous faith. They became very mature. How did they grow so quickly? We need to remember that growth only happens through the Holy Spirit. I cannot come up with a class that you would attend for six weeks and six weeks and six weeks and six weeks and have you come out the end as spiritually mature, okay? It's not about your head. There's stuff for your head, but there's stuff for your heart. There's stuff for your spirit. And that's where God begins to work. As we begin to surrender, here's how you grow in spiritual maturity, you surrender to God's will. 
you obey God's will. You do what he asks you to do when he asks you to do it. And as we do that, we will grow spiritually. We'll grow spiritually in the way and in the time that Jesus would have. And we trust him. We trust him. The next thing that uh, struck me was in verses 6 and 7. Paul says something that every time I do a Bible study on this, people stop me and they say, why would he say that? He sounds awful proud, okay? He says, to imitate me in the Christian life. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. Now just look at the first part, imitate me. Would, would you ever say that? Are you spiritually at the point where you'd say, yeah, you just imitate me and, and we'll show you the way. How many of you would feel really comfortable saying that? Hold your hand up. Anybody feel comfortable saying that? And yet Paul was comfortable saying that. Is that just because Paul was a special saint? No. And I was wrestling with this, and the truth of the matter is that people are imitating you anyway. Whatever you do, people are watching you, and they're imitating you. Your family, your spouse, your workmate, they're going to imitate you. That's the way that we grow. That's how we become. And if we know people are imitating us, then brother and sister, we need to make sure that we are imitating Christ in the gift of the Spirit. Another way that you can grow is uh, to imitate someone, to imitate someone who is, is uh, godly, someone who uh, you can almost copycat. When Richard was little, I think I've told this story, but I'll tell it again. When Richard was little, he was about three years old, and he had one of those little lawnmowers that you push around, and it's supposed to kick out bubbles, and it makes this horrible noise. You know, I got tired of, of mowing the carpet. So I was outside mowing the yard, and he got his little lawnmower out, put his cap on, and he just followed right behind me. Just copied every move I made. Two hours. Two hours, three years old. He was copying his dad. Now, when he became a teenager, it was all a different story. <laughs> uh, but then he knew he had copied how to mow the lawn, yeah, ready to move on to different things. One of the ways that we can grow spiritually is to find godly people that we know, that we trust, and who will care about us it is in finding a mentor. Now, I want to, to share something about finding a mentor, and that is it's not very often that your mentor is going to come to you. It doesn't happen very often. But you can take the initiative and you go, can go to see someone that uh, you think a great deal about uh, who is spiritually mature, and you can go to them and ask them if they would mentor you in the faith. That's risk, isn't it? Not easy. What if they say no? But it's stepping out of our comfort zone and asking someone if they would meet us in Bible study or if they would meet us in prayer or if they'd meet us just over coffee and, and teach us some of the things that they know. Uh, through the years, I've had several mentors. Uh, many of you will remember uh, Marvin Johnson, uh, Jonathan's dad, 
He uh, was a mentor for me. I asked him if he would be a mentor to help me with administrative stuff in the church. Uh, then I had a mentor who just recently passed away. His name was Paul Thomas. Paul was, uh, had a master's of social work and had I don't know how many years in training and counseling and all of that. And so I, I called him up one day and said, Paul, I've got this situation and I don't know what to do about it. He said, let's have coffee. So we had coffee and we talked over that situation. When we got done, I had a plan. And so every so often I'd call him and he would help me. And it finally got to the point that we were meeting once a week talking about how to help people. He had a tremendous impact on my life and through me on the lives of others. Now, the next thing that I'd like for you to see is in verses 8 through 10, that they tore, the Thessalonians tore the idols out of their heart. When they came to Jesus, they immediately gave up their idols and began to follow wholeheartedly Jesus Christ. One of the reasons that we don't grow spiritually as fast as we could is that we hold on to idols. You may not have a rock that you sit down and, and pray to at home every week. Probably not. But there are other idols. Stuff. When the going gets tough, the tough go. Shopping, right? Yeah, stuff. We got like stuff mart. Uh, we like financial security, especially as you uh, kind of anticipate when retirement may come. Oh my, is there, is there going to be enough? What if I outlive what's been saved up? Entertainment. Entertainment has become an idol for the last three generations. Of course, there's work, there's sex, there's food. For just a minute, you might get a pen and paper out, and, and I'm going to read you some questions, okay? And with those questions, maybe it will prompt something for you. When you are hungry and tired and angry and lonely, what do you do? When you're hungry, tired, lonely, and angry, what do you do? That may well begin to point to where one of your idols are. You go to your idol for comfort. What about your imagination? Okay, you kind of get, once in a while, you get to daydream on the job, and your daydream goes off over here, and you kind of wonder, and where's your imagination go? Is that where one of your idols is? Where do you spend your money? You get at a little bit of extra money. Where's it go? How do you spend your money? One of the ways we can see what's important in our lives is read our checkbook and uh, read our calendar and just see where the time and the money goes. It can be a little embarrassing when we look at ourselves. Speaking. Speaking to myself. What about when you have uncontrollable emotions? Maybe you're angry or you get worried or uh, you get frustrated. Uh, maybe it's anxious. When you look at all of those, mo those motives that, that just kind of go out of control, those emotions, what lies deeply under them? 
that may be a place where you'll find your idol. Because something about that idol, something about that uh, whole system will cause you to become anxious or worried. There's uncontrollable emotions. Uh, gods of pleasure, food, sex, and entertainment are, are prime ones that we see in our culture. What's your favorite form of entertainment? Now everybody's afraid to talk to me. Okay. TV, press old guys. Okay. Video games. What about Pinterest? <laughs> Got an amen on that. Nancy loves Pinterest. Um, sex is not only about, well, it's become to be about pornography. Pornography is so easy, so easy, that it, it takes literally nothing to turn on your phone, it takes nothing to turn on your computer and have it right there. Statistics of men using pornography is very, very high. It's like 90%. It's a real problem. And for young guys doing it, it's going to be a bigger problem later on in their marriage because you get, you get images, and those images stay with you. It becomes a problem. We could spend a while on that one. There's the gods of power and achievement. When you meet somebody, how do you define yourself? Here's what I do. Hi, I'm Rick. I'm Dale. Dale, what do you do? I sell farm equipment. You sell farm equipment? Do you don't want, want to know what I do? I'm a pastor of a church. Yeah, thank you, thank you. We identify ourselves by what we do, not who we really are. And we can make that an idol just as quickly as anything. Your uh, intelligence, maybe that's part of how you see yourself, that can become an idol. If it's, take, if it's taken away, what do you do? You see, power and achievement can be idols. I think I mentioned last week that... Uh, when someone is on their, their dying bed that they never ask to see their degrees that they have hanging on the wall. They don't drive their sports car by with that cool rumble. Nancy says, my, my car just rumbles through the garage. You can't hear anything else. I love it. But I'm not going to ask to have a rumble by my window. No. What I'll ask for are my friends and my family. <laughs> I want to see those five grandkids. Who knows? Maybe they'll be six or seven. But yeah. No pressure. No pressure. <laughs> The primary use of life is very simply love. To love God with all that we are and to love our neighbor as ourselves. One last thing. What do you need to let go of to get a better grip on Jesus? What do you need to let go of to get a deeper grip on Jesus? 
I'll leave that question with you, and it can ponder in your mind as uh, we go through the rest of the worship service. Uh, Let's pray. Lord, we come before you. You are an awesome God who looks down on his children. You provide us mentors. You've given us the Holy Spirit who is able to do more than we can imagine. And we just ask that your spirit be turned loose in our life, that we will surrender, and that you will have your way. For we want your way to become our way, for your will to be done, not our will to be done, and to have it done even on earth as it is in heaven. I ask now that you might bless your people. I pray that this coming week, as they think about being leaders for a Bible study group, that, um, that they'll sign up. Uh, Lord, we need lots of, of home groups. There are so many people that they get left out, and Lord, we don't want that. Uh, we fight having community, but we desperately want community. And in the midst of that paradox, we ask that you will move us toward the desire for community. We praise you, we thank you, and we honor you in Jesus' name.